think about it. Gasoline, cooking food, turning on lights, plastics, makeup, medicines. The list goes on and on. Yeah, every day the world consumes vast amounts of oil and natural gas to fuel our lives. We also consume a lot of coffee. It helps fuel our bodies. At least my body. Gotta have my morning coffee. Anyway, oil and natural gas wells are being drilled all over the world. But once these much-needed resources are discovered, what happens? How do they get it out of the ground and to where it needs to go? That's the million-dollar question for day two on my story about the industry. That and where the refills of hot coffee are located. So, how do they get the oil and natural gas from the rock formations thousands of feet underground to me, Mr. Consumer? Once we know that a well can produce enough to be profitable, we have to complete it and put it online. On online? What, what does the internet have to do with this? <laughs> what I mean by that is operational. That is producing oil and natural gas at the wellhead and then transporting it to market. I'm going to let you talk to our operations engineer first. He'll be explaining how we stabilize the wellbore for production. That's the first phase of well completion. He's out on the Marshall location. And I just happen to have a map here. You do? <laughs> to where we're going? Hey, look, you can see your house. Made you look. All right, come on, we need to go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a much. good time. I a real swell time. Oh, good job. Just, see ya. Just cold. Thanks. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> So the Action News team hits the road again. I am getting better at reading maps, I think. Hey, fellas, which of you might be the operations engineer? I am. Actually, he is, but I'm his boss. <laughs> OK, Mary-Kate and Ashley, we're here from Action News, and we just need to get some info on what it is that you do in the process. Before we start there, let me, Brad, let's go ahead and make sure we get that valve changed out on that production unit. OK, we'll, we'll take care of that. All right, see you guys Thanks, later. Thanks, Brad. It's much appreciated. Well, today let's talk about preparing the well for completion. Great, I'm all ready. My coffee's kicked in. Whew! <laughs> Sorry. Once the well's been drilled, the next step is to run the production casing down the hole and cement it in place. At this time, we will install the wellhead. This will come into play when we run the production tubing and install the Christmas tree later. Okay, for me, this is information overload. I think we're going to need to bag up and try I'll it slow again. down. Okay, thanks. Okay, casing is the pipe. Oh. which is run into the hole as structural support for the well itself. Right. It works like this. Production casing is nothing more than steel pipe that we screw together and run to the bottom of the well bore. Yes. Once on bottom, we pump liquid cement, similar to concrete but without all the gravel, down the casing. Okay. As it exits the casing, it's forced down the bottom of the casing and it's forced up around the outside of the casing between the outer casing wall okay. and the rock formation. Ah. Let's go to the production trailer and I'll show you an example on the computer. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to our on-site operations trailer. Ah, nice. It's a nice little trailer. And uh, <clears throat> this must be your trailer track. <laughs> Just very creative. Yeah, it's a very Plus creative way. All right, All right, what you got? Let me boot this up here real quick and I'll explain to you uh, via the animation what we we're discussing outside. Okay. okay, as you can see here, the production casing is being screwed together and run in the hole. Once a casing has reached bottom, or TD, which is also total depth, we then pump a liquid cement. The cement is pumped out the bottom, then it comes up and around the outside of the casing. In actuality, what's happening is the cement is filling the void between the outside of the casing and the rock formations. Okay, so what, what keeps the oil and natural gas from just shooting out while you do that? Well, the hole is filled with a special mud so that the oil and natural gas does not flow to the surface and the hole itself doesn't cave in. Okay, but now you've blocked off the flow. I mean, what's the point in that? Good question. Um, we've accomplished three critical needs. First, we stabilize the well bore. Second, we controlled any unwanted flow of oil or natural gas. And lastly, we isolated the different zones within the well, so only the zones we're targeting will produce. This way, we can perforate the well bore and tap into these different zones individually. This allows us to more effectively stimulate and monitor the production from each zone. Perforate? Zone isolation? Sounds like you're a defensive line coach talking. <laughs> well, they're all very critical and important things that occur. Um, Let's get into that discussion a little later. What I'd like to do is have you see it actually in person. Right. I'm going to give Brad a buzz and see if we can get him over here to pick you up. Okay. Brad, this is Joe. You meet over at the operations trailer and pick the news crew up. Yeah, copy. Yeah. I'm away. Sure. Roscoe, this is Boss Hog. What's your 20? I just wanted to do that. Is there Roscoe? Enough I don't that. want to mess it up. Enough. Now, once the casing is run and the wellhead is installed, then 
the BOP is installed. BOP, wasn't that a Michael Jackson song? Hi. Hello. Maybe I can help. I'm Ron Schaefer, a completion Ron. supervisor. Yeah, good to meet you. Uh, BOP is just uh, short for uh, blow up preventer. It's that bottom piece of uh, equipment there on the red. Uh, bottom, the red, right the red above thing. the black piece there. I see it. And uh, it's uh, installed prior to us going in to log or perforate the well to find the and produce the zones of interest that we're interested in. So does that keep you from like getting a, a gusher like in the old days, uh, you know, like when you drink milk too fast, spaghetti comes out your nose, that's one of those kind of deal? Yes, sir, absolutely. <laughs> Once the BOPs are installed and tested, we are ready to begin our case tow logging operations. Uh, excuse me? This is uh, an electric line that is connected to a specialized tool that is sent down hole uh, to help us in locating the depths and intervals of the oil and natural gas formations that we are interested in perforating and producing. Kind of perforating, I've heard that before. What's that about? Well, we've got a little traveling to do. We have to go to another rig. But I'm going to turn you loose on our perforating engineer. He'll get a charge out of his job. Great, <laughs> another map. More driving. Thanks, guys. Charge, huh? My credit cards are already maxed out. Cement, bought. Pumpkin Center, Oklahoma. Mark David here for Action News on site, looking for the chief perforator. Who is that? I don't know, but I think it's one of these two fine gentlemen over here. Excuse me, sir. I'm looking for the chief perforator. Would that be you? Yes, I've never been called that before, but I'm the uh, logging engineer for this wireline truck. <laughs> okay, well, I've been called a lot of things I didn't think I was. Uh, could you tell me about the perforating process? Yes, uh, this uh, tool will run in the hole first as a cement bond tool. We'll check the integrity of the cement between the uh, casing and the formation to make sure we get everything sealed off. So we put that into the ground and that paves the way for the explosives, right? Correct. Uh, could you show me some of the explosives? Yes, just step right over here. Great, I, I love that stuff. I used to you know, set off bottle rockets and of course there was an accident and they had to call me stubby. Totally other story, go ahead. Okay, this is our expandable perforating gun and our uh, charges will come out of these scallops right here. So the, the bombs come right out of right here? Yes, they are set off by a shaped charge. Okay, so what does that do? I mean, you put this underground, you set off explosives, what does that do for the oil business? Okay, we'll uh, line up, shoot this gun here and it allows the oil and the natural gas to come out through these perforations out of the formation. Uh, any other information you might be able to show me? Yes, I have some uh, dummy charges and some uh, blank pipe up here that we perforated that I could show you. Great. In the truck? Yep. Let's go for it. Excellent. Hey, that's a nice truck. Thank you. Red and white like the uh, Arkansas Razorback. Yeah, it, just, it does. It looks kind of like it. It's kind of candy striped truck. <laughs> Do you have a handle when you drive you the bet. truck? You know, I used to watch BJ and the Bear. They had handles, names on the CB. Let me get one for myself. Yeah, this is my mobile office. <laughs> and what you got oh. here? Okay, this thing is a, is a dummy-shaped charge that is out there in that perforating gun. So these things right here, they can blow through the concrete and the steel? Yes, that is and several more inches past that. Man. Okay, well now what's this piece? Okay, this here is a, is a piece of steel that one of these charges has gone off through. That puts a pretty impressive hole in, right? Yeah, I had a burrito do that to me once. Now, what were you going to show me on the laptop? Okay, we have some animation over here that I can show you. Okay. Initiating animation process. Once the gun is lined up properly in the casing, explosive charges are fired from the control panel on the truck. Power is sent down the gun to detonate the charge. Explosives burn a hole through the steel and cement into the rock formation. This allows the oil and natural gas to flow into the production casing. Excellent. You know, I think I'm really starting to get it there. Great, Mark. Hey, let me get this. Hello? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's still over here. Yeah, Joe, I'd send him over to you. Okay, bye. Joe needs to see you over at the production trailer, Mark. And that would be my cue for Mark David, signing off. Back to you. Joe. Mark, you're back. Yes, my front tube. We just completed running tubing in a well that was naturally completed. Well, now you've already got casing in the well. Why do you need more pipe? Well, production tubing is used to assist the well to flow. As you can see, we position the tubing to optimize the flow rate. Once a tubing is in place and the Christmas tree is flanged up to the wellhead, we can force the production to flow up through the center of the tubing instead of up the casing. Ah, okay. So now what? Then we attach the tubing to the Christmas tree. This is the Christmas tree. 
All right, there's bound to be some cool explanation for why they call this a Christmas tree, right? Well, in actuality, this is called a Christmas tree because typically there's valves on the bottom which are larger than the valves at the top, which then causes this to come up to a taper. Looks somewhat like a triangle and therefore a Christmas tree. The way that this is set up, the tree itself serves the purpose of well control. The number of different valves that are located each serve a different purpose. You have master valves, wing valves, and what's known as a swab valve. Each one of these valves serve a different purpose and obviously are used for controlling the well. That's it? There's no like cool story? Unfortunately not. This is a very serious piece of equipment that should only be operated by trained professionals. Okay, so then do we just back up the truck and start loading up the oil and natural gas? And... Is that what we do? Well, no, it's never that simple. Most wells require stimulation to flow. Now, now well, what do you mean by stimulation? Stimulation would include hydraulic fracturing, possibly some swabbing. Then also we need to discuss production facilities and transport procedures. Well, what are we waiting for? We're burning daylight. Well, we got a frack job on another location. Let's go. Yeah, let's do let's it. Let's go. Cool. Did I just say cool? How do we get a cow to move? You know what I think works? They like milk. Well, it's obvious that it takes a lot of energy to find energy. It also takes a lot of equipment and moolah. Gentlemen, hi, Mark David, Action News. Jeff Pelz, Marathon Oil. Jeff, good to meet you. I'm looking for somebody who can counsel me on the finer art of well stimulation. Well, I'm the production engineer for this area, so I guess I'm qualified to do that. Excellent, so what you got going on here? Well, we're getting ready to do a frack job today. Uh, what's, a, what's a frack job? Well, frack is short for fracture stimulation. We stimulate the well because we're not happy with the oil and gas we're getting out of it today and want to improve it. So how do you, how do you fracture rocks that are like thousands of feet below you, right? Come on into the command center and I'll show you. Ooh, command center, it's a field trip. Wow. Looks like a rocket control center in here. We monitor all the pressures and rates on these streams and all the additives we're adding to the frack job today. Just tells us what's going on. Fancy. And over here we got some animation to help explain better what we're doing today. And you guys are animation. We pump a specially blended liquid down the tubing or casing and through the perforations. The pumps we use create a large amount of pressure at very high flow rates. Continued pumping causes the formations to crack or fracture. We also add a fine grain sand or similar material to the fracturing fluid. The sand enters the fracture in the formation along with the fluid. When we stop the pumps, the pressure dissipates. With the pressure gone, the fracture tries to close. But the sand holds the fracture open. The propped open fracture provides a larger passage for hydrocarbons to flow into the wellbore. Wait, so you, so you crack open the rocks and then you pack them with sand? Are you kidding me? No, I'm serious. Without the sand, the cracks would close because all the rock layers above it and the pressure from those rock layers. Oh. And the sand's real porous, so it provides a great avenue for the oil and gas to flow back to the well from. Porous, learned that already. Okay, so tell me a little bit about the kind of pressure you use to bust open these rocks. I mean, it must be pretty high. Ooh. Yeah, today we're pumping at pressures approaching 7,000 PSI. PSI? Uh, pounds per square inch. Oh, PS. Pounds. Okay. And I guess you could say a 7,000 pounds per square inch stream could lift a pickup off the ground. Pickup truck? These pressures are extremely dangerous. We have to scrutinize the job design and check our lines before each and every job to make sure there's no wear and tear. Yeah, I guess better safe than sorry, you know, when you're talking about that kind of pressure, right? That's, that's right. We're all about safety out here. Oh, yeah. Ow. <laughs> oh, phone. Hello? Yeah, Glenda, Mark's right here. It's for you. Hello? Hey, Mark. Glenda here. We just happen to have a swabbing job in the works at another location not far from you. And what, swabbing? Well, John will give you directions. Yeah, and guess what? I think he has a map. Okay, I'll, I'll find out. Okay, well, have fun. Another map. So we're near, we're near the, uh, the world's largest macrame dinosaur. Right here. We're trying to get right here. Up, you say? Uh, you must be the reporter from Action News. 
Oh, yeah, hey, news travels fast. <laughs> you know, news, traveling for news. What gave me away? The uh, cameraman? Hi, Brad. Hi. No, your uh, dress slacks. Okay, so, so tell me this. Where are the pirates? <laughs> See, because you know, we're swabbing no. the rig. No, there are no pirates out here. Uh, there's no pirates. <laughs> swabbing is an operation that's used when you have a well that uh, will not flow naturally. Yes. When the producing formation doesn't have enough pressure, pressure. to force the fluid to flow to the surface. Right. The oil and so. natural gas is being held yeah. back by hydrostatic, hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure. Right. Hydrostatic pressure is what I was thinking. But that doesn't really answer my, my question. Uh, how, how do you swab a well? Let's go check it out. All right, all right. See, swabbing is accomplished with a workover rig like this one. Now, on a workover rig, there's a sand line, some metal cable that's wound together and spooled on the top of the rig itself. Okay. On the end of this line is a long steel tool called a swab, swab. and it's fitted with some rubber cups. It's about the same size as the uh, production tube you guys have in the truck there. Rubber cups. Yeah, swab cups. Okay. Now, on the end of the swab line is a tool that holds the swab cups. The swab allows fluid to pass down through the hole, and when you start out of the hole with the swab, they'll seat horizontally inside the tubing. And this will cause the rubber to swell against the tubing. And you pull the swab with the sand line on the workover rig. The frac fluid, along with any oil and natural gas, is forced up the tubing into the test tanks uh, as the suction pulls it up. OK, I heard what you just said, but, but it sounded like rubber cups, frac jobs. For pushing tanks. Yeah. So if you could like paint a picture, I mean, do you have like, do you have like a laptop? There's people been showing me like their animation and stuff. Well, I thought it was self-explanatory, but uh, uh, yeah, let's see. If, uh, maybe, let's just try a little little visualization. Okay. 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 I'm a so I want person. you to close your eyes. Got it. And I want you to visualize. Cheeseburger. Not that. Oh. As the swab tool is run down the hole into the fluid, the cup is collapsed. Once the tool reaches the target zone of the well and the cup is pulled back up, it expands, therefore lifting fluid out of the tubing with suction. Okay, so what's the point of this? Well, it's to reduce the amount of frac fluid that's being held on that zone. Therefore, the amount of back pressure will subside and allow the well to flow better. Well, what do you do with all the stuff when it you know, comes out of the well? Well, let me take it from here, Eric. I know you're busy. Great, glad I could help. Hey, thanks, Captain. Sure. Uh, now, back to the fluids. Of course. We need to do something with all that fluid to recover, so in this circumstance, we use, we're use we using large portable tanks. We call these frac tanks, like those over frac there. Frac You know, I saw those before. OK, so now you've got all the, the substance is flowing smoother, better at starting to. What do you do with it after that? Well, once the production is underway, the oil, water, and natural gas flows out of the perforations, into the tubing, through the wellhead, down the flow line, and into a big vessel called a separator. Let's go take a look at all the equipment it takes to process fluids. Well, I'm more interested in seeing something that brings things together. A separator, geez, a smooth separator. You know, I had frac fluid once, and what they did is, is it was after swimming. All I see is a bunch of beige, because I've been colorblind since birth. Not my birth. When my brother was born, my mother kicked me in the head. So which one is the separator? Well, this is it right here. Basically, the purpose of the separator is to take the three-phase fluid which is combined at the wellhead and separated into its three parts. As explained, the gas and fluids flow into the separator. Since natural gas is lighter than liquid, it rises at the top where it can be measured and transported through a natural gas pipeline. Now, so how does a separator work? I always heard that oil and water don't mix. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that, I'm afraid. It goes through a device called the heater treater. Ah. Well, this is the heater treater unit. In this case, the heat inside the heater treater helps the oil and water separate and rise to the top. I see. So then you just skim it off, huh? Well, like I said, it's now separated and transferred into large metal stock tanks. Once the stock tanks are filled, the oil is sold and sent by tanker trucks or pipeline to the refinery. Well, then what do you do with the natural gas? I mean, I mean how do you get the natural gas to market, especially if it's a, a natural gas well? Well, once accounted for by the gas meters, the gas flows directly into the natural gas pipeline. These pipelines are built and owned by service providers that operate gas plants to further refine the gas. Then, once the natural gas is processed, the service providers sell and transfer the gas all over the country. Over the last 10 years, the network of pipelines has really expanded. A lot of it has to do with the fact that natural gas is such a wonderful product. 
clean burning, very abundant. You just have to drill for it and get it to end users. Okay, so then you just make a connection and uh, just turn it on. Not quite that simple. Oh. After we establish the Christmas tree hookup and the gas has gone through the separator, it still might have a little fluid in it. So we run it through what we call a stripper. Uh, well, what, did, what does she do? Well, let me show you. Okay. Oh, this guy. This is the stripper unit. Ah, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty stripper unit. <laughs> Thanks. Here. The stripper clears the gas of any remaining fluid. Okay, well, well then what? Well, then the natural gas is metered so we know how much natural gas is being put into the pipeline. When there, it's pushed along by powerful gas compression motors, which are spaced miles apart along the pipeline. Okay, so hold on a second. So what happens to the water in the separator process? I mean, does it just evaporate or what's the deal? No, the separated water flows in another tank, like those over there. What are those called? Tanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, what, so what's the water used for? Cheap car washes? Yeah, not exactly. Oh. Believe it or not, it's put back into the ground. Oh. The salt water is trucked or pumped to a water disposal well where it's pumped into a salt water bearing rock formation. So, but all this is environmentally safe? Yes. Right? We, oh, okay. We wouldn't do anything that damages the environment. No, no We damage. take every precaution to assure that we protect Mother Nature. Yeah, oh yeah, Mother Nature, she's, she's my second favorite mother. Hey, you know what I haven't seen yet are those uh, rocking horse head bob kind of things. What are those? Well, that's a good question. That's a pumping unit. And the purpose of a pump or a pumping unit is for artificial lift. See, this comes into play usually once the oil reservoir has been, has been depleted. See, as we produce oil and natural gas from a reservoir, the pressure gets lower and lower. So, so it's kind of like when you got an extra thick shake and the straw in it, and you're trying, trying to get the bottom, you're like, <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, like, you know, it's really sucking, get brain freeze. Yeah, I just got one now. All right, I'm, I'm better. Okay. Is that kind yeah. of thing you just can't get to the rest sort of it? Sort of like that. They're good, though. Yes, they are. Don't you knock frozen thick shakes. See, but in the well, though, see, as the pressure, reservoir pressure is reduced, the well no longer has enough energy to flow the production to surface naturally. And so, so is that where a pump comes into play then? Yes, and actually there are many different types. Some are electric operated, some are gas operated. We put a downhole pump in the well and it's activated from the up and down movement of the pumping unit on surface. Well, is there any way around here that we can see one of these babies in action? Sure, I bet we can get Ron Schaefer to style one up for us. Ron Schaefer, well, if you can, hey, let's get Ron Schaefer and that'll be a cut. Where's the camera guy? Dave? Dave? Hey Mark, I'm ready to roll on this whenever you're ready, so uh, we can just kind of Get it Kind of ready. something on your nose, right? This is unbelievable. It's huge. You know, I think, I think I saw Madonna ride one of those in her last concert tour. It's called a mechanical plunger pump. Okay, please explain before I explode into laughter. As the uh, pump plunges down, it's causing fluid from the reservoir to enter into the pump chamber. On the upstroke, the fluid in the chamber is forced up the tubing through the flow line and into the separator. Sounds kind of like a mechanical bucket brigade, right? Uh, so to speak. Uh, it functions on a counterbalance system. The weight of the rods and the downhole pump that are attached to the horse's head are counted by the huge weights attached to the arms of the pumping unit. Uh, that's interesting. And that's because if the counterweights are approximately the same weight as downhole equipment, then it's said to be in balance, and then you can turn it with a relatively small motor. So uh, now do you send it off to the refinery? No, not yet. You need to talk to the transport engineer about that. We're getting ready to load some up in a few minutes. Follow me. All right, let me wrap this up. All right, let's go back to you in the studio. This is Mark David for Action News. We're out of here. So, uh, so you're hauling all this oil off to the refinery? Is that what's going on here? Well, we plan to, but you know, first we have to test the oil and make sure it's marketable. See, sometimes a little bit of water gets mixed in with the oil, and if it's above a certain percentage, we can't take it. So let's ask the tank tech. Oh, hi. Mark David, Action News. I'm Mark Robert. Hi, Robert, good to meet you. Hey, Robert, can you tell me, why would there be water in the oil? I mean, if you, it's already gone through this separator thingamajiggy. Thing. Well, sometimes a, a very small amount of water gets mixed in with the oil. We're just testing to ensure the quality. Plus, we want to check the gravity to determine the weight of the oil. Excuse me. So, so how, does he, how does he check all this out? Well, he takes samples from the tanks and comes down to the truck and puts it in a centrifuge, which separates any sediment or wastewater to the bottom of the test tube. Then we get our percentages. Ah, okay, okay, speaking of that, I got a big question. Uh, those tanks, how big are those tanks that hold the, that hold the oil? Those are about 300 barrels. Sheesh. All right, so let's say that this passes the inspection. Mm -hmm. What's the next step after that? Well, then it's transported to the refinery, and there it's refined in the thousands of products we need and enjoy. 
All right, now, where were we? Yeah, hey, Robert, I got a question. Have you ever had to actually, like, climb down into those tanks and, you know, clean up in there? You know? No. no. We pretty much stay out of there. We leave that to the specially trained maintenance crews. Oh, yeah. I, I guess you would have pretty strict safety standards to oh, stick to. Oh, yeah. yes. No. Those tanks yeah. are full of fumes. Yeah. A spark. Even static electricity could ignite the fumes and cause the tanks to explode. Really? Mm -hmm. We're gonna move the interview over about 100 yards. We're gonna go this way. <laughs> We're no, right. I'm not kidding, I'm serious. We're uh, gonna move it this way. It's okay. All right, well, we'll <laughs> speed it along then. Yeah, well, back to work, man. Thank you, Robert. Wow, it's, it's quite a journey from uh, thousands of feet under the ground to the end user. Yeah, and quite a bit of money, uh, technology, and trained professionals make it all happen. Well, thanks for all your help, Brad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, really, thank you. And I'll, I'll always think of you when I have gas. That's good to know. See you later. There's Chickasha. Stoke, Oklahoma. Now, from Chickasha, which direction Can are we? It? Are we uh, Stoke, Oklahoma. Yeah, I got it. I'm With that, I had one last thing to do. Stop back and say goodbye, and thanks for all the hospitality Ow. I've been shown. And, of course, one last question, or two. Probably going to need to trip out of the hole. There we go. I can handle that. All right, take care of it, Bill. Thanks. Jeff. Hey, Mark. Hey. You had enough? Uh, just about, but if I could be so bold as to ask just one more question. Fire away. Uh, what do you do with the well when it's played out? I mean, when you've, when you've squeezed everything that you can out of it. We plug it. See, today's oil and gas industry is all about producing these wells real efficiently. Still, each well's production inevitably slows down over time until producing the last reserves actually costs more than it's worth. At this point, it's time to plug the well. Well, it seems like such a sad end to something that's worked so hard. How do you do it? I mean, quickly and painlessly, I hope. Well, what we do, Mark, is we fill it with cement. Then we cut our surface casing off about six foot below the ground level, and we weld a steel plate over the top of it. After that, we bring in earth and bury it, and then we plant grass over the top of it so it won't erode or wash away. Well, that actually seems kind of nice. Don't feel like we're just walking away from it. We clear out the area and the land is restored so it can be used for other things. As you can see, the oil and natural gas industry does a whole lot more than just digging a hole and striking oil or natural gas. It takes a lot of preparation and dedication to do the job efficiently. Pardon the pun, it's kind of like a well-oiled machine, isn't it? Yeah, you could say that. Yeah. But the most important thing is, is the number of jobs that one of these types of operations creates, both within the oil industry and also in the service sector. Well, like what? Well, mostly through oil field equipment makers, tool companies, computer and software makers, and chemical manufacturers, to name just a few. You know, even bottled water suppliers. You know, those roughnecks get plenty thirsty working on the rig. See, everyone benefits from our efforts in so many ways. It's our job to keep the oil and natural gas flowing. We simply make our lives easier. Now, what about the future, Jeff? I mean, you know, we got to run out sometime, right? Well, there's a lot more oil and gas out there to be found. As technology and science continue to develop, it provides a way for us to go out and explore and produce other resources that maybe right now we can't find. And as these sources become usable and broadly affordable, we'll be the ones to bring them to world markets. Well, Jeff, thanks for the tour, for answering all our questions. You've been a big help. This is Mark David signing off for Action News. Back to you, Frank. Excellent. Hey, uh, do you mind if I keep the helmet and the safety gear kind of as a souvenir of our adventure? No problem, Mark. Excellent. Consider it our gift. Thanks, Jeff. It'll make a great uh, lawn mowing hat. All right. All right. Have a nice day. Be careful. Come on, man. See you later. With that last remark, we turned off our camera, loaded up in the van, and started the trip home. I had a story to write. I have learned terms I didn't know existed before. PSI, uh, uh, genuine roughneck. BOP, wasn't that a Michael Jackson song? Perforate, zone isolation, sounds like you're a defensive line coach talking. I don't know. Met people who perform mind-boggling processes and tasks on a routine basis. Oh, and I had to read a lot of maps. Yeah, I experienced an industry that's dedicated to fueling our world. An industry I can now say I have a new respect and gratitude for. Especially each morning when I'm taking a nice, hot shower.